Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On this episode of Frankly Speaking, we are joined by Peter Sednebi, Sweden's special envoy to Yemen, to ask about the implications of the Saudi-Iran deal on his work. If a peace deal is still a priority to Europe, given its focus on the war in Ukraine, and if an increasingly divided Yemen can be put back together again. Mr. Senebi, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Now, apart from being a career diplomat, you've also been Sweden's special envoy for the Yemen conflict since 2017. Frankly speaking, apart from the humanitarian situation, which matters not just to Europe, but to the whole world, why should Europe care more about what is happening in Yemen? Well, there are lots of uh, reasons for that. You, you mentioned already one of the most important reasons, and that is the humanitarian imperative. We are engaged in, in uh, any country in the world where uh, the population is suffering for whatever reason, be, be, it, fa be it war or, or be it for uh, natural reasons. But there are also um, a lot of uh, more hard-nosed uh, interests uh, for Sweden and the EU to engage on Yemen. Uh, Yemen is important for the security, not only for its immediate neighbors, but also for, for us. Uh, the, the Middle East is a neighboring region. Uh, we uh, trade a lot with the Middle East. We get a lot of our energy supplies from, uh, from the Middle East. And if you look at the map, uh, Yemen sits uh, right on uh, the most important maritime uh, supply route uh, uh, there is. Uh, this is something that has uh, become even more important uh, and rather paradoxically after uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, one might uh, assume that uh, more faraway conflicts would, would be relegated to the back burner from our point of view, but that is uh, not the case. Uh, the, the energy security is, is uh, more important than ever as a result of, uh, of that conflict. Then I can add uh, other security-related uh, um, issues as well, uh, counterterrorism, for example. Any uh, uh, country with weak institutions involved in civil war, where, where uh, the, the political uh, system threatens to erode, as has uh, been the case in, in Yemen, uh, of course, uh, would provide opportunities for, for terrorists if um, there is not the kind of uh, support, uh, uh, both in terms of security assistance, but, but, but also uh, in the longer term in institution building that uh, the European Union can definitely provide uh, in cooperation with its partner countries uh, in, in the Gulf area. Will you say that the crisis in Ukraine has actually put more of a spotlight on the war in Yemen? But we've also seen the prolonged truce in Yemen, as well as the Saudi-Iranian peace deal. It feels in many respects that the conflict in Yemen has now fallen down the list of priorities in Sweden and indeed in Europe. No, I, I would not. Uh, I would not say so. Uh, the the war in Ukraine has uh, definitely made us think a lot harder about how we uh, secure our, our uh, uh, trade routes, how we uh, secure in particular energy supplies. And, and uh, Yemen has a strategic location uh, with uh, uh, immense importance for uh, energy supplies. I would say also that the, the, the humanitarian uh, imperative uh, is, is always there. And, and um, there has been a lot of additional attention to humanitarian issues in, in other conflicts uh, as a result of the, the disruptions uh, of the uh, deliveries of the supplies of, of wheat and grain uh, that we have seen as a result of the, uh, of the Ukraine war. Uh, so there, there is definitely, definitely a link here. There are lots of people thinking very hard um, about this, and I 
um, definitely do not uh, agree that um, attention is falling. What what has changed, and and uh, which is uh, unfortunate, uh, is that there is uh, less uh, funds uh, available for uh, assistance of, of, of various kinds. Uh, there has been uh, an enormous effort, as you know, uh, uh, for supporting Ukraine uh, from, from, the, uh, from, from many countries. And um, we have seen, as we, we, we have asked, uh, as the United Nations has asked for uh, funding for uh, its humanitarian appeal in, in Yemen and in other countries, uh, uh, that uh, it's more difficult uh, to get those uh, those funds. This uh, has to uh, be done through a joint effort. Um, and um, it's, of course, not only Sweden, Europe, uh, countries in, uh, in, in the north uh, that uh, should provide uh, funding to the UN, uh, UN efforts. We, we're having a constant discussion with our uh, partners um, in the Gulf area, and, and uh, I would expect that this would become an even more important topic uh, for our joint strategizing about Yemen and other conflicts, that uh, uh, the, the Gulf countries uh, should also uh, contribute a larger share uh, to the joint uh, UN efforts. We, what we see today is that they uh, often prefer uh, contributing through their, uh, making their contributions uh, through their own uh, bilateral channels, uh, which uh, deprives us, uh, we believe, of some of uh, many opportunities that we have to, uh, for, for taking care of, of synergies uh, uh, by, uh, by working together. Well, you say the humanitarian efforts has put the spotlight on the crisis in Yemen, but it feels like for the everyday person in the street, they're talking more about what's going on in Ukraine than indeed in Yemen. But let's talk a little bit about other regional developments. I mentioned a moment ago about the Chinese brokered Saudi-Iran deal. So I'd like to ask you, did this peace deal, did it take you by surprise and what is by both your impression as well as the sentiment in Stockholm towards this agreement? Well, it uh, did not take us by surprise that uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran agreed to re-establish uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, uh, there have been, had been talks taking place uh, for quite a long time uh, some of them uh, hidden from the public view, but um, many of them also publicized, if not in details, uh, the, the, the world has been aware that they have taken place in, in, in particular in Baghdad and in, in, in Moscow. Uh, so it was clear that something uh, was in the making. Um, what took us by surprise uh, was that uh, China uh, in the last minute appeared as a facilitator or, or mediator to enable the, the two countries to take the, the final step. Um, uh, and it's always the final step that's the, or often the final step that's the most um, difficult. So it was a major uh, contribution at the end by, uh, by China. Okay, so you say you weren't hugely surprised by this announcement, but what about the everyday person in Stockholm? What kind of sentiment uh, or impression have we seen there regarding this deal? Well, it's, it's obviously a good thing that uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran have uh, normal uh, relations uh, with each other. We expect, uh, at, at the same time, um, I don't think one should expect, uh, uh, exaggerate the expectations in, in the long run, what, in the short run, uh, what it would mean for, for uh, economic interaction and uh, uh, regional security. There's still a lot of work uh, to be done uh, in order to move from the formal deal uh, to actually establishing the trust uh, that is uh, necessary for a more, more dynamic um, uh, relationship. It's, it's clear that both countries had similar objectives for, for different reasons, I would say. They were both uh, keen on, on removing uh, the difficult bilateral relationship, which had been a distraction 
in, in the past, uh, with Iran being under a lot of uh, pressure uh, domestically and internationally, with Saudi Arabia wanting to focus on its uh, economic development agenda um, 2030. So the, the, the conflict uh, or the remaining conflict uh, distracted them from, from issues that they consider to be more uh, difficult. Uh, Yemen is obviously a case in point here where uh, we will have to see uh, what the impact uh, what the impact will be. Have you seen any impact yet on the situation in Yemen or is it too early to tell? The Saudis and the Houthis uh, have uh, engaged in, in quite extensive talks after the uh, uh, Saudi Iranian uh, agreement was, uh, was announced. So there is obviously, uh, it, it has opened up possibilities that, that were not there before. But I still think uh, it's still too early to say whether the two sides uh, in those talks have uh, adjusted their expectations uh, sufficiently in, in order to actually reach uh, an, an, an agreement. Uh, it seems uh, that the Houthis are still asking for 100% of insisting on 100% of what they want to achieve, or maybe even increasing the, their demands, asking for 110%. That will not do the trick, um, obviously. Uh, they will have to strike a compromise uh, in the end. How much influence would you say that Iran actually has over the Houthis? The Houthis have become strong actors, have, have been uh, strengthened considerably uh, as a result of the Iranian support uh, over the course of not only since the war started, but, but even, uh, even before the start of the war. Um, so they, they have been dependent on, on that uh, Iranian support, but uh, they have now grown to, to become, uh, I would say, uh, something like an indispensable part of, of the uh, political life uh, in Yemen, which means that they have uh, their own platform to to stand on. That may be it may appear problematic to to some people, but I think it's also it involves also an opportunity in the sense that uh, the Iranian military support uh, is no longer uh, necessary uh, to the extent that it used to be for the Houthis to uh, survive. They can uh, rely on on the platform, uh, political platform uh, that they uh, have, have, have built. So the, the, my assumption uh, is that ultimately uh, they will uh, secure the gains uh, that they have made in the military field uh, by uh, uh, entering into a political deal, a political uh, um, arrangement that will give them a, a kind of respectability, or I would say, perhaps legitimacy that they have not um, in, in enjoyed in the past. That means also that uh, the uh, Iranian influence will probably not, uh, well, it's never been total. Uh, the Houthis have taken their own decisions. Uh, they have needed the help uh, of, of the Iranians. But I, I would assume also that the Iranian influence will, would gradually be reduced even further uh, uh, if, if, if the Houthis are, are, will move uh, from a military mindset uh, to a political mindset and then secure the, the and politically secure the gains uh, uh, that they have already made. So you say Iran doesn't have as much influence over the Houthis today, given they're not relying on Iran's military presence anymore. What, what kind of leverage does your country, Sweden, or indeed the EU have over the Houthis? If you'll allow me to say it, it's not as if the Houthis are particularly bothered about being part of the international community or spending their holidays in the south of France, for example. Before answering the question about Swedish and, and European influence, I, I would like to disagree with, with the, your conclusions from uh, conclusion from my last uh, answer. Uh, the uh, Iranian influence um, may be uh, 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 may be reduced, uh, 
uh, compared to what it was uh, uh, at an earlier stage in the conflict. Uh, the Houthis are taking their own uh, decisions to, to a very large extent. Um, uh, but uh, Iran remains uh, the best friend, supporter uh, of the Houthis and, 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 and has uh, uh, maintains an influence uh, that we expect them now. And, and I think this is a message that the world should send, that, that in, in the wake of, of the Saudi reign, indeed, we of course expect Iran to use that uh, influence uh, positively uh, in, in, the, uh, in, 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 in order to, to secure a permanent truce uh, to, um, and, and, and to launch an inclusive uh, political process with, with uh, participation of, um, of the Houthis. The Houthis have so far uh, not been willing uh, to engage in a political process uh, uh, for, for various reasons. They, they, they consider the Saudis to be their, their main adversary and not the legitimate government of, of, of Yemen. Uh, uh, that, needs to, uh, that needs to change uh, and uh, and here Iran can uh, can definitely play a role and it, and is expected to to play a role. You may remember that uh, we uh, Sweden hosted uh, uh, a meeting in Stockholm in December of 2018, which was in fact uh, the first time since the war started uh, that uh, the parties to the conflict agreed on anything. There were some problems in the implementation of that agreement, but it has uh, played an important role because the framework uh, that was uh, agreed in, in, in Stockholm has continued to be the framework for all subsequent uh, uh, discussions, including, uh, I, I would say, to a large extent, the discussions held uh, between the Saudis and, um, and the Houthis. We are working... Uh, uh, increasingly closely uh, together with our partner countries uh, in, in the Gulf area uh, to find ways of supporting uh, Yemen's uh, arduous road towards uh, peace and, 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 and prosperity. The uh, foreign ministers of the European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council had uh, a meeting, a joint meeting last year. There will be another one in Muscat, in Oman, uh, uh, later in the autumn of this year, in, in, in October. And I expect that uh, Yemen will be uh, uh, an important point uh, for discussion um, at that meeting, how we can support uh, uh, Yemen uh, with, with joint efforts uh, uh, together with, with partners in, in the Gulf area. So you say there's been a solid amount of support from GCC governments. Let's look at it more internationally. A moment ago, we were talking about leverage and influence. Now, there's been articles in The Intercept and others that suggest the Yemen war can be stopped if Biden wants. Now, the insinuation here is that Washington has been dragging its feet on this matter. Is that something you felt, or do you feel America can put in more effort to resolve Yemen? I think the United States has done uh, quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, giving attention to the uh, conflict in Yemen and supporting the conflict resolution efforts. You may uh, remember that uh, President Biden, in his very first uh, speech on, on foreign policy that he held at the State Department just a couple of weeks after the inauguration in 2021, mentioned Yemen, uh, I think, as the there was a second country that he mentioned uh, in, in that uh, speech. And, and uh, Yemen has been on the agenda constantly uh, in discussions with, with both Saudi Arabia and, and uh, other partner countries. Of course, it's important that um, the Americans do this in, in cooperation with others. We are working very closely with the Americans as well. Uh, uh, the Americans um, don't have direct communication channels with, with the Iranians, others have. So I think it's, it's not correct to assume that the, the, the Americans by themselves would be able to do this if they did. It sure, but what or, can the U.S. do more and, of? And, 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 the, and the other aspect that I would mention here also, that this is, it's a conflict that is taking place on so many different levels. 
uh, if you look at uh, the situation inside uh, Yemen, where you have uh, a conflict uh, between the Houthis uh, and, and the rest, um, um, essentially, uh, where you have a conflict or, or where you have, I wouldn't say conflict, but where you have uh, very distinct uh, uh, interests uh, in the north uh, and, and, and the south, uh, that, that do not always um, coincide, where, where you have a lot of other internal fissures also that have uh, just, uh, that have existed um, since a long time, uh, but which has, uh, have come to the fore as a result of the war, then you realize that this is an effort uh, that will require considerable joint uh, efforts by uh, everybody who, who uh, is able uh, to uh, support Yemen and, and, and to have an influence in different ways uh, on, on different uh, Yemeni actors. Well, let's talk about some of those regional efforts. You've recently returned uh, from a visit to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And of course, you're in constant contact with the powers that be on the ground in Yemen. So how confident are you that the current ceasefire is going to be able to hold? Do you think this could turn into a permanent peace deal? There was a truce negotiated by the United Nations, by the UN Special Envoy, my compatriot Hans Grunberg, at uh, the beginning of April uh, last year. Uh, that was then renewed a couple of times. It expired uh, in early October of last year, uh, which uh, we, of course, not only we, but a lot of others uh, regretted. Uh, but on the positive side, uh, we uh, have noted uh, that uh, the ceasefire, even though it has formally expired, is still largely observed. And uh, this is an indication, I think, that uh, the parties to the conflict at least are, are reluctant when it comes to taking a step back to, uh, uh, to open conflict. Uh, we still have uh, a window of opportunity and it has been pushed a little bit more open uh, after the uh, Saudi-Iranian uh, agreement. So I, I'm, I'm mildly, uh, hope, or I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, uh, we can see a, a more permanent and a more formal monitored uh, ceasefire being uh, negotiated. I, I do think uh, there is hope. We are uh, in a better place uh, than we were a year and a half ago, and we are in a better place uh, than we were a better place than we were a year and a half ago before the the truce, and we are in a better place than we, than we were half a year ago before the, the Saudi Iranian agreement. Well, we have seen this extended truce, and yet the Houthis haven't been putting on their best behaviour. There's recent reports of looting in various areas, demolishing the house of the Interior Minister's undersecretary, even messing up graves. How could such a group be part of any legitimate government? Well, they, they, they are de facto a political force to reckon with in, in, in Yemen. Uh, of course, there are many aspects of, of their uh, policies and, and, and behavior that are frankly not uh, acceptable. You mentioned some. We, we also, there are also obstacles to the deliveries of humanitarian assistance that we, uh, is, are problematic uh, in, in the north of the country. Uh, we are seeing actually a reversal of, of, uh, the, of, of some issues uh, that the Houthis used to complain about. We, we had uh, in the past many complaints about uh, what they described as a blockade, a uh, humanitarian blockade uh, against uh, the part of the country that they uh, controlled. Uh, they, they referred to, to uh, restrictions on, on uh, uh, shipping through the port of Odega, for example. But what we are uh, have been seeing now recently in the last few months is that uh, the Houthis are creating obstacles to uh, uh, or depriving uh, the legitimate government of uh, revenue through the attacks that it uh, carried out uh, 
in, in the relatively recent past uh, on, on ships loading oil uh, in, in ports uh, controlled by the government. We, there, have been, there have always been a trade of, um, uh, of cooking gas uh, from Marib in the government controlled part of uh, Yemen to the Houthi uh, controlled part. Uh, that trade has uh, stopped. Uh, the Houthis are, are uh, seem to be buying their gas uh, from, from other sources, but this is yet another reason why uh, the government is strapped for cash uh, in, in a way uh, that, is, that is highly problematic. And uh, while the Houthis may think uh, that uh, this is a bargaining chip in, in, the, in the negotiations. I, I, I really don't believe that uh, that it facilitates that I really don't believe that it facilitates negotiations at the moment uh, where uh, the way to go would rather be goodwill gestures, uh, actually not only from the Houthis, but from both sides. How likely do you think we are going to see Yemen being redivided into north and south states once more? I don't want to put any, I don't want to make any prediction. The, what, what I uh, would like to say is that this is uh, a question uh, that will have to be decided by Yemenis themselves. And uh, this can only be done uh, as part of a comprehensive uh, uh, political process. It may very well be that that process will will uh, uh, will result um, in in a partition, um, and then the world should uh, should respect it. I I would also add that I I believe that most countries uh, would prefer a unified uh, Yemen. Uh, I think partitions of, of of countries are although they have happened. Uh, are, are always uh, difficult and, and, and messy uh, matters. But ultimately, this has to be uh, for, for the Yemenis. But it's a, it's a secondary issue. Uh, the, uh, the primary issue that all Yemenis need to focus on at, at this moment uh, is to bring an end uh, uh, to the war and to sit together uh, at one table or in, in, in one room uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, all, all the very important and very difficult uh, issues that uh, Yemen is, uh, is faced with. And there are, uh, there are many issues that are more, much more urgent uh, for the citizens of Yemen than uh, uh, whether uh, uh, Yemen should be one or two countries. Well, I know you don't want to give predictions, but it does get even more complicated as it seems that in terms of the southern separatists, there are those who even want to divide the country further, whereby Hadramaut is its own state. How likely do you think it is that we will see the country divided into three Yemens? You're touching um, an important point uh, here. If you, if you start separating uh, one part of the country, uh, there are always... Uh, those who are not going to be happy with uh, uh, with the people in 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 in, in charge of, of of that part uh, separating. So there is there is always uh, the risk of a of of, of a chain uh, reaction, and and this is the reason why I uh, very strongly believe, and it's not only my conviction, but uh, of, of my colleagues and 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 any. And, and, and most of those are engaged in, in Yemen, that the Yemenis need to focus on stabilizing the situation, on the economic issues, on, on uh, recreating institutions uh, that have been falling apart and, and, and so on. And after that, uh, the uh, issue of partition uh, may not even uh, seem as urgent uh, to those who who, uh, who, who uh, uh, advocate for it uh, at this time. Well, this, of course, makes things very difficult. And my understanding is that even Saudi Arabia and the UAE are not fully aligned on the final solution in Yemen. Now, the kingdom would like to see a united solution. The latter supports the South and having its own state. 
What do you see as the solution? Are we looking at a federal state with two capitals, a referendum? How does this end? I really don't know how it will end. Uh, 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 it, it can, uh, there are many different, different scenarios, but the, the question of whether Yemen should be one or two countries, it, it's not an, an issue that should be in the focus of attention uh, today. Today, we need to focus on, on the more urgent uh, problems. And I, I, I think that those making decisions in Riyadh and, and uh, the UAE and in Abu Dhabi, they agree on this. Uh, they all, they, their, their prime, prime concern is that uh, Yemen will be stable, that it will not be a source of uh, insecurity um, anymore that it will be sufficiently prosperous economically to, to uh, uh, support itself to, to a much larger extent than um, is the case now, that it will, uh, that it will be able to export it, its uh, natural resources and, and, and so on. Uh, so these are, uh, are, are the things to, to concentrate on. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, uh, that, that Riyadh and and Abu Dhabi agree on these uh, 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 most important and, and, and most urgent uh, in, uh, tasks in, in, in Yemen. What about the Safair oil tanker, which has been described as a ticking time bomb? Has there been any progress on that front? Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, one uh, issue where we can actually have been some progress in, in the sense that uh, there is a work plan agreed uh, between everybody who is involved. That was not easy at all. Uh, uh, there has been a, a replacement vessel uh, purchased. And, and um, I believe that the, the, the actual work is uh, starting uh, these days on, on uh, securing uh, uh, the, the software tanker and... and, and uh, replacing it with a new vessel and and, and removing the, uh, the the oil from uh, from Safar. Uh, there's still, as far as I know, uh, a, a gap uh, in uh, financing. Uh, uh, I think it's around uh, somewhere between twenty and thirty million dollars that are still missing. I am I'm, I'm fairly confident. Uh, I hope that um, this money will be raised fairly quickly so that the whole operation will be so we'll be able to see through the whole operation uh, to the end it's important that this is done because the alternative uh, if uh, the software tanker starts to leak or explodes is, is so horrible that it's almost not possible to think about it we will see the destruction of, of uh, the marine environment in in the uh, in, in a large part of the red sea for for probably a generation uh, at least. And, and uh, that includes also the livelihoods of, of a lot of people who are dependent on, on fishery. Uh, it will have, uh, uh, apart from the uh, environmental consequences, also very, very dire humanitarian consequences. Indeed. Mr. Sednebi, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate it.